Hi everyone and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Serena Fazan and we are on countdown to Tampa Bay 55. So excited to be broadcasting. I like to say out of my new set here at CP Communications and Red House Streaming, my co-anchor, very familiar name in the Tampa Bay market and really, really across the country. I mean, you've done so many stories. You've covered every single president. <laughs> um, you've covered every Super Bowl that's been here. But it's been here, yeah. But yeah. it's been here. And Jess, and joining us, um, via Zoom. Sorry, brothers, Greg and Steve, one of them playing against Tom Brady in college. That is Steve. Greg Belisari playing for the Buccaneers. And currently, uh, you're an orthopedic surgeon, right, Greg? Yeah, that's correct. I've been practicing now over 10 years, which is kind of hard to believe. But yeah, practice in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, keeps me busy. It's all pro, yeah. uh, uh, pro football with you. Okay, how exciting of a time is this? It has come, obviously, because of the pandemic. It's very different this year. But from where we came in 1984 with the first Super Bowl in Tampa Bay, where everybody was scared to death because they knew it could propel Tampa Bay to become more of a uh, community where people would come for conventions and all. Obviously, we got the Republican several years ago. But they also knew if we blew it, that nothing would ever happen again in Tampa Bay in terms of um, uh, an event of this magnitude. And so now here we are with our fifth Super Bowl coming to Tampa Bay. Obviously, it was, it was, it was just a, a wild time uh, back then. It scared it, it wasn't going to do, do well. And talk about making history as well for this Super Bowl. I mean, for the first time ever in NFL history, the the home team of the Super Bowl. So let's turn to Greg Belisari, who actually played for the Tampa Bay Bucks. Greg, tell us about that. When did you play? What was your experience like? Well, I was really fortunate. I played uh, my rookie season was 97, 98 season, and I was there for the two years. I had just unbelievable people there and, uh, you know, coaches. You know, Coach Dungy, amazing men I've ever um, The defensive staff that I played for was Monty Kiffin, Rod Marinelli, Louis Edwards, and all those guys were prominent fi figures in football still to this day. And so I was very privileged to be a part of that. And we were I was actually there at a time when they were really turning the corner, uh, really getting to a point where, you know, we'd made the playoffs my rookie year, and we had made the main point for the Bucks uh, into kind of what we know as the modern history and the Super Bowl win uh, sprinkled in there. It was a really, it was a really great experience. Obviously, um, you know, fell never ends when the way you want it, but I uh, enjoyed all my time there. Were you were you part of the team that went to Green Bay? Uh, yeah. under, under, under Dungy. That was, that was, I was there for that, that week. It, it was awfully cold, yeah. man. <laughs> I, I, I got a I, funny story yeah, about that. Yeah. Tell it's, it's, it's one of the few things I actually vividly remember because at that point, I think we had not won a game. You guys can help me with the but degree, below, but it was like maybe below 45, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it was below uh, <laughs> 32. Like below freezing, you had never okay, won you. <laughs> Right. So I'm a, I'm a rookie from Ohio State thinking, gosh, you know, we're really tough. So I talked the linebacker room into wearing short sleeves. Of course, playing if you're playing in the game, the, the weather is kind of relevant. You're, you know, you're keeping your body warmth. Of course, I'm a rookie. I'm not starting. I'm not playing. I'm running down the field as fast as I can on special teams and then running to the sideline and waiting 15 minutes and then going back out and running back down. Well, that's the worst weather to be doing that, right? To be doing bursts of speed and then sitting. And I was miserable. I mean, so I, so we, unfortunately, as you know, we, that was, a, I think, a divisional round. We didn't win that game. And Brett Favre, you know, for the third time in one year, pulled a lot of magic out. And uh, But I vividly remember that being pretty cold. It was freezing. I tried to stay because I could go to the press box. But I wanted to be on the frozen tundra of Green Bay. I stayed on the field as long as I could before I had to scoot to the press box. But my favorite part of that is we got to Lambeau Field at 8.30 that morning. And it was 
heck? Like, wow. They, everybody yeah. had been, been tailgating, and they were toasted. I mean, absolutely Whoa. toasted at eight. And they saw we had Tampa Bay stuff on. They'd go, hey, Tampa Bay, you want a beer? You want a broad? You want a shot? And we went a little early for that. They said, oh, the game's not for four hours. You'll mind. They're very friendly people. Oh, yeah. Cold. Holy cow. They're, well, it's really cold. Their fans are amazing, though. You can see why they have a tradition there. And interestingly, Jerry Wunsch was a center from where his family made it to the Green Bay games. And, and we had the same experience after the game. <laughs> it was pretty, a pretty cool place. And, you know, Greg, you mentioned um, Tony Mann I have ever met and Monty Kiffin and that whole crew. I mean, okay. amazing. You I've got, straight, a, I've got a dungy. Okay. Um, I was, after college, I was working uh, in Jackson, Michigan as a radio station. I, I did some TV in, in Flint. But the high school football games of the the, um, the high schools there, and we did four games. We did uh, two on AM, two on FM. And I did the time broadcasting some of the games where Tony Dungy was the quarterback for Jackson High School. That's I, I'm old, guys. I'm really old. So Mike said, said he has been working in broadcast for 50 years. Yeah, I, I can share that, right? Yeah. We were talking about that prior um, to going on camera. Well, Steve Bellis said right at Ohio State. Tell us about that. Why don't you share that story? Yeah, I, mean, I had the opportunity to play against him twice, actually. We were both. Um, both actually playing um, so really had to try to prepare against him in a, a totally different light, whereas my sophomore year playing quarterback. And uh, that was a year, unfortunately, and if you look at the, the history of Ohio State, we've been really good recently, um, <laughs> actually exceptional. And I would say we were kind of transitioning to that time. And um, we were six and six, didn't have a great year. And Tom just had some head down and just playing hard and, you know, focusing on the task in front of you, which I think you've seen him do throughout his career uh, consistently and done, and done it very well. So he gave you advice directly, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'll take all the advice I can get. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, know, you know, Steve, one of the things that, that I have read is all the Buccaneers say Peter and does give out advice and talks to him and is hard on them and himself and that he could not do that with Belichick. Belichick, right? Like would, Bruce Arians gives him gives him the rope. The rope, but Belichick. So I mean, this guy was a natural born leader from even way back in college when he was in Michigan. Yeah, no question. I think uh, there's one thing time in his career is consistency. Um, what you're seeing him do on the field isn't all that different of what he was doing at you know at the end of out, and um, he's been that consistent leader every step of the way. So let me ask you guys this, and. Um, Talking about what you mentioned, Mike, early and what great going to Wisconsin and the stands, or the, the stadium being packed, right? So clearly right now we're in unprecedented times. COVID, we're not going to be able to, to, to fill all of the stands. Talk, talk about that energy. Like you guys both played pro, right, Steve? You also played pro as well for the Rams. Did you play for the Rams? Yep, I gave it a, a, the college try, I guess you could say. It was there for about a year and a half and then uh, did arena football for about five. So a little bit different um, from a capacity standpoint, but yeah, I, I tried professionally as long as I could. Did you guys ever play against each other where your parents had... No. No? Unfortunately, uh, we just missed each other. Okay. But they made history, you know, Ben's. At Ohio State, at different times, so history, adrenaline, the fans. Does that really? What are the what are the players dealing with like right now without being able to fill the stadiums? Either of you guys I can answer. I think it's I think it's really yeah. Well, I think it's really hard. I you know I I've been to sporting events over this COVID to the Columbus Blue Jackets here and University. I think it takes a lot. Um, you know, everybody that shows up in a professional capacity is a pro and they're going to go out and they're give their best effort. Um, but it is, it does play a big role during the course of a game, you know, not having that reaction when a big play happens, I think affects them. And, 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 and oppositely, you, it's hard to demoralize a team. In other words, you can somebody pretty fast, but it doesn't have the same weight when your crowd's not behind it. So it is kind of a fun, you're seeing the, uh, I hate to use these terms, but the Grizzly vets doing well and thriving in this scenario because of the ups and downs of the fans as much. But it, it definitely is definitely uh, is different. It's just a weird phenomenon. It worked to the Bucks' advantage the fact that they won three road games in the playoffs in some normally very noisy spots. I mean, mm -hmm. the Superdome is crazy with, with noise where you can't even hear the, the count from the quarterback, and they didn't have many uh, uh, penalties for uh, uh, jumping off side, legal motion. And then Green Bay, you guys know how loud it, it gets in Green Bay. So 
I, because they had to play all their playoff games. Mm-hmm. The Bucks advantage. Because I could hear Brady calling off the audibles, I know. Uh, I you do. know, off the team doing that. I it's think a huge you advantage on... to the offense. Yeah, I agree. Go ahead, Steve. No, I was going to say, I mean, the reality is, as an offensive player, being able to communicate effectively and get your players in the right position or make those adjustments is so pivotal. And you, you spoke to it. You tried to do that at the Superdome or in Green Bay. It's, it's really difficult. So giving someone like Tom Brady the ability to communicate and everyone be on that same page has been a huge advantage, in my opinion. So how do you guys think this will affect the Super Bowl, though? The big game, the game of all games where you want you want everybody to be there. How do you think it's going to affect? Guys, you know, I, I think Greg brought it up. I mean, momentum's a real thing. And um, you look at the different le- levels of players. And I think Grizzly Vets, this is old hat. They're going to show up and do their job. I think the emotion of it for some you'll see that play out. But, I mean, we saw that happen in the national championship game this year, but that momentum swung so quickly, they really didn't have those fans back. So uh, I think it'll have an effect, but the reality is I think it'll help the offenses more than anything, uh, allow them to get a lot more done. But I think, you know, especially for the young guys, as you talk about, there there's such a high in playing in the Super Bowl mm-hmm. that, that they will be laser focused. I mean, even a guy, uh, a veteran who's never been until this year in a playoff game, all those great thousand yard receptions that he's had the first seven years, but never been in a playoff. So I think that they will all be so laser focused. Uh, it appeared that way. I was in, in San Diego for the Bucks win in San Diego, which was just insane. terrific. Yeah, it, it was, was insane. It, it was insane. But they all, and we did a lot of interviews beforehand and then clearly afterwards, and um, they were all so focused on the game. Some of them, I think, just made the, the, the crowd go away because all they were focused on was winning, which you could see. <laughs> I, know, yeah. I know you can see it. You can see it. Well, Greg, speaking that, you're really, really close to Rondé Barber, who, of course, was on that team, on that Super Bowl winning, uh, winning team. You must yeah. have stories. Rondé have... and I, yeah. yeah. Well, we were rookie roommates. I think. You must yeah. have stories. Rondé have... and I, yeah. yeah. Well, we were rookie roommates. That's actually godparents. I'm like my godparents too. His two girls, and uh, he's my no pressure for my son, of course. <laughs> but uh, you know, it. Uh, he's a great guy. Obviously, not only a super talented guy, but a super intelligent guy, and and a great friend. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was a privilege to play with him. And you know, when I was there, actually, you know, the short time I was there, he was still kind of. Um, climbing the ladder, learning the ropes of being an NFL cornerback. And you could see the potential, obviously. But, you know, I, I think a lot of uh, – Rondé is a very similar player to Tom Brady in, in the sense of just the mental capability and the toughness to, to deliver time and time again consistently is, is something to – I think that's what you respect about any, any player who's made it in the league more than five years. He needs to be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, look at <laughs> seriously. Look no at doubt. There's his stats. And then he has the, the greatest play in my mind in Bucks. He still get goosebumps. Get, when I'm it's serious. Like, uh, I'm wearing long uh, sleeves uh, right now. I wish you could see uh, my goosebumps, but I'm uh, getting goosebumps right now. I know. I game, and I knew I was going to mm-hmm. cover it if the Bucks won. Gosh. <laughs> That Sorry. interception, I had big. a bunch of friends at my house. I kept screaming, run, Rondé, run. I'm going to the Super Bowl. I'm going to the Super Bowl. What, I mean, just a great play, a great guy. But really, he deserves, and, and so does Lynch, too. There's no, it's hard to, you know, from a fan standpoint as well. Both of them, just just people that, that you want to emulate, that you want your kids, your son, not only great athletes, but great people, which ultimately is so much more important. Right, and Greg, you know, if you can talk about, too, since you are, you know, uh, so close to Rondé and just, and Steve as well, like, you know, just the perspective, what are they going through right now as they're getting ready for the big game? Well, you know, I, I think um, you guys hit it on the head, that laser focus, that internal pressure is going to be there. And I think almost in some ways it sounds um, counterintuitive, but the Super Bowl fan, it's a split crowd anyway. It's probably more important for those uh, earlier playoff games, but the laser focus and the internal pressure will be there. I think um, sometimes the not knowing what you're what you're under or the pressure that's around you is almost sometimes better. And the people, uh, the teams, and the players that can focus on those small details to win the football game are the ones that are going to come out on top. And that's that's where it's at. And, and the coaches know it. 
that's what they focus on all week or for you know two weeks and you know sometimes you can overthink it and 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 it's really just about playing loose playing fast but being laser focused when you're out there what do you guys think you know not often do the two Super Bowls have had an opportunity to play each other during mm-hmm. during the season? I mean, the Bucks did well against the opponents they played against, beating twice, and then beating losing to them twice. The fact that Kansas City and and Tampa Bay have played each other, how does that factor in? Is it an advantage for any? No. Uh, it's hard to say. I, I would say to Greg's point, you know, you eliminate the noise these two weeks going into it, and I, and I think the Super Bowl is going to be more about what each individual team is going to do versus the other one. And I know that sounds really simple, but um, it really gets down to the team that's going to execute when those one-on-one focus becomes eternal. Um, yeah, you, you, it's great to have some experience and know what they're capable of doing, but this is really more about Tampa Bay's ability to go execute versus, you know, the schemes. A great matchup and it's going to be a great game because oftentimes we get to the Super Bowl and, you know, it can be a landslide, right? Or one team is way, of course, you're enjoying the Super Bowl, but it seems like these two are really well matched up. I agree. I mean, I, I won't talk about the that, but, you know, from a defensive matchup standpoint, the Buccaneers fare really well. They're one of the few teams in the NFL that can match up with this offense. And, uh, you know, both both mentally by scheme and really by speed and ability. So that's what I find really intriguing in this game is, is Kansas City's looking at that film going, they're one of the few teams that can hang with us. Well, in having Vita Vea back, it really made a difference. I think that in, in Sunday's game, or two Sundays ago, it, it, it gave Shaq Barrett an opportunity to be wild, JPP, white, because you need him, Vita Vea, mm-hmm. or you're going to get those other guys. And he was still with two guys pushing back to, to rock, pushing two guys, the other guys. I think that's really significant. He wasn't the Kansas City game. He was still recovering from the broken ankle. So I think that that is a huge difference on defense. It'll be really interesting to see when it all plays out. Greg, I wanted to ask you, though, speaking of playing out, from a, from a physician's standpoint, what are these guys, how much, I mean, they take some hard hits on the field. So can you just, can you just talk about that, like the physical, like what they're going through on the field? Well, there's no doubt. I mean, <laughs> you, can, you can liken every single contact point to a car collision. I mean, there's that much force and just an offensive and defensive line play, for example. So the forces are immense. Um, the way uh, that athletes train has really improved um, their health and decreased the amount of injuries throughout the season. It's well known that, you know, in, at least in the medical side of things, that by the end of the season, you know, fatigue of even small muscles such as your core puts you at risk for other injuries. And so fight in the training during this year is really crucial. And uh, most athletes, you know, almost by self-selection don't make it to that level unless they have that internal drive to train some genetics that are in their favor. But it's uh, it's a lot of wear and tear. Wow, in, that same, like, yeah. in that same vein, what about the concussion protocol with Mahomes? To, does, as a physician fan, but as a physician, does it give you mm-hmm. concern that, that he still might have some hangovers from that concussion? I, you know, concussions, well, I, I'll, say, I'll start by saying if you put 50 doctors in a room and ask them to define a concussion, I don't think one <laughs> single definition would be the same. So if you start with that premise, it makes it difficult to say what exactly he had. You never really head bonk. Um, but there are guys that can even get concussions from getting hit hard in the chest. You know, we see it in car accidents all the time. All that being said, my my off-the-cuff analysis of that is he did have a concussion, obviously. I don't think it was severe. I, sus- I don't suspect he had lingering symptoms. Based on the NFL protocol, if he was already practicing that following week, he likely had completely normal scores on all of his tests and didn't have many symptoms when he started to um, do any challenges such as exercise. So I suspect he had a mild concussion. I don't think it'll be lingering. I think we're going to get full Pat Mahomes. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of um, the practicing and playing, though, at the very beginning, and you, and, you know, Steve, um, Greg, both feel free to weigh in on this. So at the very beginning with all the COVID protocols, they weren't practicing like they typically do. So how much of an impact does that have on players? I think... Um... No preseason games, and I think it's fair to say the football at the beginning of the NFL season across the board wasn't great. Um, And finally saw players getting their stride and getting comfortable and knowing their spots and who, you know, how and who they're going to work with play out now in the playoffs. And that's been the difference. 
I know it's been so, I mean, I've been noticing. I'm oh, yeah, and even yeah. Brady said it took a while for them mm -hmm. to, to gel. And, and they also said the Chicago game was a turning point because they won that game. They had so many penalties, and they said, we are a better team than than this. And, but it was it was almost like they were doing preseason up to Chicago, mm -hmm. lost their first game in Chicago, and they said, we got to turn this around, guys. But I, especially when you get a, a brand-new quarterback with a whole new system, um, you know, there were times when he and Evans weren't always on the same page, although right. they were thankfully a lot of the times. But I mean, it, it takes a while to know where the play is, where you're supposed to be. Like what that Bears game really was the turning point. Like I felt that's when after that game. Abs abs absolutely. And, and I think the Bucks will tell you that uh, as well. Okay. Did Tom Brady lead us to that point, lead us to this point? I mean, is he the reason we are in the game? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on, come on. I mean, Jameis Winston could throw. He was amazing at times. He could throw the ball extremely well. Brady has had some interceptions, but that's, that's rare. And he comes back and his accuracy is there. The team foundation was there, but the quarterback is the driver of the vehicle. And we needed a new driver. And Tom Brady is, you know, the uh, ultimate. Do you agree? I'm biased, right? I'm a quarterback. And you know, I, I probably thought I was a lot better than I really was in reality. But um, one of the things that I would say Tom Brady does, and this has been really true of any great quarterback or leader for that matter, in a game, you're going to make mistakes. You pointed to those interceptions. It's how you recover from those and manage them. Um, and if I look at some of the greatest to ever play the position, Joe Montana, Tom Brady. Um, Brett Favre. <laughs> Brett Favre, <laughs> you yeah. name it. Mm -hmm. they, they all made those mistakes, yeah. but their ability to pull that team together and point to that. But I also look at what Coach Arians and personnel-wise and the things that they all put together. You know, on the flip side of that, and my brother can attest to this, that D in tune too. Because the reality is, as a quarterback, when you throw that interception, you're putting that defense in a really tough spot where that becomes a problem. Um, so the reality is, like, there's that two-way street. And I think that's where Tom's mastered this. Um, the best quarterbacks have, but, you know, to your point, Tom. How about you, Greg? What are your thoughts about it? Tom Brady, the piece of the puzzle the oh. Tampa Bay Buccaneers needed? I think he's clearly um, the statistics that have been thrown around the last two weeks uh, now that we knew he was going to the Super Bowl are just absurd. You know, some of the things he's done in his career. And so it's not by happenstance, right? It's, it happens because of the hard work and the mental acuity that he has and the and just the, the unbelievable production he's had. So I think he is the linchpin. Obviously, the the framework was there for the Bucks to be there, but he he's the linchpin. You know, the other key guys, it seems to me, this is a non-selfish team. Everybody, because, I mean, look mm -hmm. at all the receivers. And I have seen teams where, you know, one guy is, is like the Bucks. They just want to score. They right. don't care. If they, you, you can't uh, underestimate that effect. The, take Gronk, who's a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, he's willing to his And he seems almost as happy to block as well as catch a 20-yard uh, pass. And he is protected. I've seen guys coming in and he's just laid them out and, and whether it, it, it's uh, you know, Mike Evans or a B uh, or, or, or Chris they, they all are pulling for the other guy and I, th I think that, that's, that camaraderie that, really yeah. shows mm -hmm. and I, I think that that's you got to give the coaches credit for that the coach and won't allow and, and Arians had, had jumped on Brady's case when he screwed up I mean it's it's equal all across and the players seem to appreciate that and understand that. I think that's a big uh, factor in the Bucks. The Bucks fun team to watch. I mean, this football season has been great. Now Tampa Bay is making history again. The first, you know, home team, their city, you know, we're making do. We've had some great guests on the podcast talking about the financial impact. You know, I just want to thank you, Stephen Gregers, both, both of them playing former professional football, both making history as captains of um, two brothers, you know, for joining us. We really so much. And Mike Deason, I've got to throw yeah. out, I mean, I've got to give you a plug for your book here. Um, bad news for you is good news for me. 50 years of broadcasting right here. So where can you get the book? Amazon. It's on yeah. Amazon, and the Audible will be out in the next couple of weeks as well. Are you going to be voicing the Audible? I did. You did? That's was, fantastic. Let me, let me tell you, I have read thousands of my scripts over the years. That's not hyperbole. Reading a 230 
is a bear. <laughs> Thank goodness for editing it, meticulous. But it it was it was quite the project to uh, narrate your own book. But I really enjoyed it and enjoyed writing it. And again, it's on Amazon. Bad news for you is good news for me. I hope you, you like it. If a lot of sports stories in there as well as investigative stories. Well, I'm very excited to read it. Thank you, General Manager of the Studios here at CP Communications and Red House Streaming. You need streaming, you need to sign it for me. I okay. definitely will. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. I'm Serena Fazan. You can watch the podcast and all my podcasts on Facebook, YouTube, and of course on my podcast channel, On the Record with Serena Fazan. Please follow me on social media, making history together. Stay safe, but have fun as well. Thanks for watching. What if you had to choose between fixing the roof over your head and putting food on the table? Mold growing in your home. Focus on finding a new job or your children could no longer focus on learning. What if you no longer had a safe place to call home? Hibbers who have lost jobs and have to make those difficult choices. Text rebuild to 484848. O negative blood is the universal blood donor. It goes to trauma victims, it goes to newborn babies, and everybody else. Blood is needed no matter what. And I know that I'm helping at least three people with one unit of blood that they are able to save lives. I'm universal. I'm unique. I'm O negative.